All right, everybody, welcome back to Sunday morning here at the 60th annual Daryl Starbird's Custom Auto and Truck Show. And uh, I found one of my buddies down below painting and talking and BS. Down like below. Go, down yeah, below. Down below with the dregs of society. Yeah, and yeah, the, the, the lower end of life. I, I, I saw him down below because I'm on the upper balcony. I don't want to brag, but I was. And I saw him down there, and I'm like, dude, we got to go talk to him. And you know so, what? You're up here with all the big hitters like at Cobo Hall. All the big hitters are upstairs and all the... You know, rat rotters are downstairs, so they keep it the same at all the car shows. Do they, is it all the same show? Yeah. I mean, rat rotters go downstairs. Rat rotters go downstairs. So, for most of you who don't know, obviously, um, Big Daddy is his father. So I got Little Daddy Roth right here this morning with me, hanging out and and chewing the fat a little bit. Of yeah, you know, when Dad was alive, I he told me sign your name, Big Daddy Junior. You know, but when Dad died in two thousand one, I go, you know what? I'm just going to be Little Daddy Roth now because. Uh, Actually, that was my name when I was 17 years old in the Army when you had mail call. Really? Big Daddy had sent me letters. You know, had the Big Daddy logo on it. He did that right away. Yeah, Even in the, the Army, that's how he sent it yeah, to you. Yeah, and the clerk. That's so wild. Yeah, man. so when the clerk got up there to call out mail call, they always called Little Daddy. Really? So I just went. To, I just became Little Daddy when Dad died because I didn't want to sign my name like Big Junior. It sounded like Jumbo Shrimp. Or, I was going to say, you're, you're kind of like, jumping up. Big Junior? Stuff. Who's that? Who's yeah. Big Junior? Right. Somebody's going to start looking at down below. We're like, well, those guys pretty well endowed. <laughs> you know, what's going on? Big Junior. Right. <laughs> so Big Daddy, obviously, when it first started, when did the name Big Daddy first come out? How did this all epic Rat Fink whole world that everybody knows it's all over the world everywhere? Oh, well, you know what? How that happened is uh, a, a kid named Jimmy Keeler was 16 years old. He worked for uh, Rebel Incorporated. And my dad had just uh, got rid of the Model A, you know, the little jewel, and we built this uh, deal. Well, I was I was in kindergarten. I didn't really work on any cars till the Beatnik Bandit came along, the next car. But uh, he built the. We're outlaw. talking early fifties now. Yeah, we're talking because I was born in fifty five, the year of the greatest Chevy ever, and yeah. uh, the Outlaw came out. I think uh, we were building it in fifty eight. I remember it being built. My older brother, you know, used to live inside of it. You know, when dad was watching them. When dad was watching them. Yeah, yeah. That is so killer, man. So uh, we only had a one little garage on Slauson Avenue. So dad built it on the apron of the lot. But, you know, when that car came it's, out. This California, right? Yeah. Uh, when that car came out, it did change so many things. And when, like I said, Jimmy Keeler got it and they brought it over and uh, to Ravel Girls and, uh, you know, made a model of it. And that was like, you know, the beginning of my mom and dad signed a contract with Ravel to sl uh, supply a car a year. Okay. And uh, so that kept all us kids busy, you know, like 70 hours a week building cars because my mom and dad didn't hire no one to build cars. It was always a family-ran business, right? Yeah, and so, but there were, there was people that worked there like, you know, Dave Mann or Von Dutch or those guys, but they, uh, Ed Newton, Robert Williams worked in the shop every day when I was a kid. And I think a lot of people forget about this. I mean, now, I mean, kids even, I mean, remember 2024, <laughs> Yeah. It's so crazy. And Rat Fink and the, the, the toys, and everything, they're still all over the place, and people are just going nuts for it. So I don't think a lot of people realize that Von Dutch, all these guys, started because of your father's shop. Uh, yeah, you know, he gave a lot of people that were, you know, like uh, supposedly, you know, the downtrodden or the, 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 the dregs or the worst, you know, of everything. And yeah, uh, always gave him jobs and stuff. Like, you know, Robert, killer, man. Robert Williams was working for a, a packaging company that made boxes for different sized black glasses and cups. And Dad... Saw his drawings, he goes, you know, I'll, I'll hire you, come in and be my uh, art director. Because my dad and Ed Newton really never got along very good, you know. And uh, so Ed Newton was out of there after about a year. Okay. And then uh, Robert Williams came in. and uh, But but what happened was after the first uh, outlaw was built, we had to build cars like once a year, like Beatnik Bandit, Rotar, Orbitron. They didn't make uh, models of those cars, but... The ones they did make model of, of the Beatnik Bandit, and then we uh, got a car in there called the Tweety Pie, a Ford. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, yeah of but, and so that was the first car my mom and dad bought, customized, made a model of, and sold it right away because they didn't want to, you know, a Ford T bucket to be part right, of it. Right. So, so your father's idea. So, so Big Daddy's idea was now a lot of people don't realize we're talking about model kits as we have a couple examples here shown on the desk here. So the the model kits were all that was the biggest thing for kids in the fifties and sixties. Yeah. So your dad it was, was before rock and roll. Like we had uh, albums out on Capitol Records called uh, Rods and Rat Finks, Hot Rod Hoot Nanny, Sir Fink, Man. and uh, Capitol Re And so that was in 63. And when the Beatles got here in 64, you know, dad always thought the Beatles knocked mom and dad out of the box. But Sir <laughs> was big. And that was like models were the first albums you could buy, you know, yeah. like and have something cool at your house before, you know, when, I don't know, 63, 64, 65, Mysterion. I mean, 
my mom and dad sold like I think it was like two million copies of what? uh yeah, Tweety Pie the first year. Come on. No, yeah, two million You're copies. talking in what, sixty six? Yeah. Yeah, two they million two albums. Million co- I mean two million albums, two million models. Yeah. Two million models in nineteen sixty six. Yeah, dude. For a dude that was just doing stuff yeah. out of his garage. I mean Right. And see, so so it was Damn, so it wasn't for epic. this kid as uh, so cool. bringing that into Ravel. And then, you know, as as time went on, uh, and we finally built the uh uh surfite, you know, because we were building the cars that weren't uh symmetric, they were asymmetric. Yeah. It was a lot easier. Because after the road agent, you know, it was so symmetric and looking, we built the Orbitron, Surfite, Mysterion cars that were easier to build. You yeah, know? yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, but and then, these were all the ideas out of your dad's brain. I mean, just all or the artists that you guys had hired. Now everybody's coming yeah. up with ideas. Well, I mean, there was always ideas, and like I can't even tell you because, like, growing up, there was thousands of ideas. Even as we were building the buck for the fiberglass, you yeah, know, uh, to put over it. But in uh, sixty wow. or sixty five, somewhere in there, uh, the surfite model was out on the uh, uh, shelves at the hobby shops. Mm-hmm. But uh, Life magazine had, you know, uh, wrote an article about the Hell's Angels and put that Dad was the, uh, you know, supply sergeant to the Hell's Angels, and Ravel dropped him immediately. I remember this. I yeah, remember and this. so I like talk you, base, and I'm glad yeah, you brought that up, man. That was uh, so cool. If you uh, like, you know, have a surfite model original issue, they actually pulled those back off the shelf though so that's why those are worth the most amount of money now you know like oh, uh, it's off the hook then they and they reprinted them real soon after that too. really yeah so it is so after the hell's angels episode uh, incident there yeah so was there a lot of uh, uh a lot of controversy dead dead lawyer up or what's going on did you go after everybody or what no i him and my mom got divorced no no actually there was just like a fight over you know, it ended up being a fight with my uh, dad and this guy called Carl Morrow, uh, you know, took care of some business over at the shop one night. And, and it, that was over then. <laughs> took care of some business at yeah. the shop and then we're good. Well, to you go, know, man. by then my dad was a, a twice black belt. Yeah. In Lima yeah, Lama but, and Taekwondo. Yeah, I was going to say, your dad, I mean, it, it it goes through, I mean, and, you know, obviously, you know, back in the day with my, my old man was a boxer and also yeah. stuff like that too. I mean, they, they were bikers, they're were, they were badass dudes back yeah. then. So your dad, I mean, above and beyond the cars, the market and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, he was in martial arts. He was everything. I mean, yeah. Big Daddy earned his name, Big Daddy. Yeah, yeah, he did. He, <laughs> you know, and you know, the weird thing is, you know, uh, by sixty seven, sixty eight, sixty nine, when we had Chopper's Magazine, that was sucking so much money away from the t shirt business. Yeah, and uh, you know that it just went downhill. So when my mom and dad got divorced, you know, Big Daddy he got all the cars. And, yeah, and that's when we put him in Movie World Cars of Stars. Yeah, and my mom got the business and Rat Fink, See. Oh, so, so that's how that split so, up. Oh, yeah. So my mom owned Radfink until the year 2000. But see, so, in, and what year did they get divorced? In the late 60s? Uh, in 70. So for 30 years, my mom owned Radfink, but dad was out there selling it, right? Get out of here. Yeah, like, so, well, he right. still knew we wanted to protect right. the brand. Well, he was selling it to Moon Eyes, trying to get a million bucks for uh, Radfink. But what happened is Damn. once he realized you can't sell stolen property, and, <laughs> you know, R- Rebel was still paying my mom in the year 2000. Well, really, he, he got married into the year 2000. So my dad took all this money he had from, you know, Moon Eyes and yeah. my mom to get. Uh, to get so my get dad, owned, my dad only really owned Ratfink that in the 2000. And then, then he, and he got married in 2000. Yeah. So when he died in 2001, he left Ratfink to his last wife. I think it was about the sixth wife. Yeah, but really? Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, no. yeah. So like, big daddy got big daddy got. Yeah, big so daddy that's why you'll see a lot of more uh, like rat pink stuff in Moon Eyes catalog. You'll see tail light lenses, little pop up locks, ash Oh man, trays, every, it's it's insane. Yeah, yeah. because Moon Eyes uh, sells a lot more rat pink stuff because they're trying to you know recoup that million dollars from dad. Yeah. After he, you know, when he finally did own Ravel, I yeah. mean, when he finally did own you know rat pink, he. Uh, you know, left it to the people in Utah up there where he lived in, uh, you know, Manti. Really? Big, big polygamy city up there in Utah. Wow, oh, man. <laughs> That's a hell of a story, man. Yeah. But so my dad it. had three wives before he was Mormon, and then when he was Mormon, he had three more wives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he, you know, he was Big Daddy. He was <laughs> Big Daddy. I mean, I guess the name goes all, no matter where you are, you got a Big Daddy up no matter what what you're in or what you jump yourself right, in. Right, right. Yeah, he gets it, it. He's like, dude, I'm Big Daddy. Yeah, give, me three more those, give me three more of those, man. Right. You know, <laughs> but you know when I when I was a kid making shirts like uh, for Mickey Thompson on Friday night, and then you know go and uh, trade him Mickey Thompson the T-shirts for fuel for the dragster on Saturday morning at Lions or yeah, you know Don Garlitz, all these guys they, they were all my dad's friends, you know yeah, and uh, 
I, still to this day, dude, you know, I was down at Don's. I think, you know, I was only eight years old selling decals at Lions Drag Strip, and Don was a big hitter already. You know, he was born. He was a heavy hitter at that time. Yeah, already, he, man. he's the same age as my dad and my mom. He was born in 1932. So and dad was how old when he passed? 80, uh, 69, the age I am now. Get the hell, he was only 69. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this might be the last podcast we have with little daddy right here today, but so congratulations. Yeah, so when I see uh, those guys like Don, who's still alive, or Gene, you know, at uh, Winfield, it's like, and, you know, those are my dad's friends that, you know, I always looked up to. Yeah, You know, yeah. now it's like, you know, they're the old guys, except for not being able to hear, you know, Gene yeah. and uh, Don are doing real good. Oh my God. I mean, Gene's still painting cars. Yeah, that's what I mean. I, I don't know how he's doing it. I Me mean, neither, man. I saw a video the other day when he was out, you know, I was talking to him, and I was like, he was like, yeah, you just painted another one. I'm like, I said, he's still doing it. He's like, he goes, dude, he goes to work every day. Yeah, he does. shop every day. Yeah. So reflecting back of like we talk about what's going on in today's demographic and kids and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. You're eight years old. You're on a drag strip and you're exchanging T-shirts that you made for fuel for the drag strip for your. Yeah. You, you know, because like we had to work when I was a kid, you know, my mom and dad, uh, there, I had four brothers. There was five of us boys. And I think it was like when I was 12 years old or something, I, uh, I uh, started, uh, you know, keeping a time card at the shop. I was going to school and keeping a time card at the shop, and but I was learning about uh, child labor laws. You know, yeah. So I put I put my uh, time Sounds card. Sounds like my kids, man. Yeah, I put my time card in envelope and I wrote a, pr a letter to President Nixon. Goes, you know, I'd like to have a day off because I know there's child labor laws, but Big Daddy has us work seventy hours a week. I sent my time card. And Come man, on, really? No, no, dude. Hey, Robert Williams still talks to it to this uh, talks about it to this <laughs> day, dude. So, Big and Dad, you're 12 years old. They sent someone down to the shop to talk to me. Oh my Big god, Dad, what did Big Daddy say? So Big Daddy went out there with the guy first. You know, he's from the state or whatever, and you know, but so Dad comes in and goes, "They want to talk to you." So I go on the sidewalk. I'm talking to the guy. He goes, uh, "So you know, you uh, the child labor laws don't apply to you because these are your parents. They're making you work, and you know." uh really 70 hours a, a week you know going to school and working you know it ain't bad you know you're yeah. learning something how to build cars and stuff they legit came down there oh yeah you. and oh then i told that him that is so flippant yeah. awesome, but man. since dan woods worked for my dan that then you know and i knew he was a foster kid i yeah i i said well you know if you can't get me a day off can i go to foster parents you know <laughs> yeah dude <laughs> And so then I can imagine, oh like, God, when that guy goes, hey, I want to talk to your dad that. again, you know what I mean? So I went back in the shop, and dad went back out there. But, you know, I'll tell you what. After that, the beating stopped, you know. I was going to say. Was it, beat on us was, it, was there a little respect after Big Daddy? Yeah, after that? still had to work, but, yeah, he didn't, oh, yeah. you know, beat on us. And uh, so when my mom and dad got divorced in 70, I did, yeah. I'm the only one that went to live with my dad. You're the only one? Yeah. And how many kids are there total? Five. Five, Five total. Boys. Yeah. So five boys, and you guys were always working in a shop with dad. Yeah. Okay. And then after that, dad had women that had kids, and they all say they're Ed's kids. You know, oh, yeah, my dad yeah, had yeah, a vasectomy yeah. in 1960. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have it reversed, baby. He didn't ever, he didn't ever well, reverse, eh? Yeah. So, but, you know, through that, you know, through that, having to work 70 hours a week, artwork, T-shirts, cars, yeah. then I still basically do the same thing. You know you, what I mean? After. So, so many years, yeah. You do so much the same thing over here. I mean, the other day, man, I mean, just, yeah, I just, I said hi to you again, and I'm like, I didn't have a coffee mug. So you literally took yourself like five minutes and you were talking to me in Austin and you kind of drew this up here, you know, for me. Yeah. And that's what you love doing. And uh, so where did the art artistic major come from? From what his dad, or did you learn how to drive uh, get in school, you know, or is it just all freehand? You learned from you know, well, when I was growing up, uh, Ed Newton, you know, like I said, Robert Williams, Dave Mann, Von Dutch. Von yes, Franco, epic, epic names, bro. Uh, Larry, you know Larry Watson. All these guys were artists, and I would always tell Dad, "Oh, like I can't airbrush like Franco, or I can't do a painting like Bob can, or you know I can't do colors like Newt or black and white art like Newt. Like all the T-shirts you ever see of all of our stuff is done by this guy Ed Newton. So this, so like this here, we uh, we grabbed yeah, a couple of drawings. That fifty-five so Chevy. So like this fifty-five, this epic fifty-five Chevy. This is Ed Newton drawing. Yeah, really. Okay, yeah. so now this is, how old is this drawing? Uh, that was 65. See, a lot of people will go around on the T-shirt thing and go, hey, I love your dad's artwork. But my dad's artwork really, uh, just by his own, you know, writings in his first book, he didn't, you know, it's it wasn't good, you know. And okay. so we, we he hired all the right people to do it. He said he was more of a producer. But my dad's artwork came out like this, building the cars, mixing the plaster, troweling out and making those cars. Yeah. And my dad's pinstriping his heart that, and lettering. My dad was a great like uh, ad agent 
you yeah. know, like, uh, uh, you know, just setting up stuff. Just you know, setting that, up stuff. Yeah. So. Like, he was display and artist. He was display artist. And, but, I mean, all the famous cars that we've seen. Now, obviously, we saw a ton of these over by, like, Shutton's place and all this stuff. I mean, oh, your yeah. stuff is all over by Shutton's. And Dave's got it. Oh, my God. It's just unreal over there. To see what we have going on. Yeah, when, when um, I was 13, we put all the cars in Movie World Cars of the Stars. And uh, then uh, Dad traded them all to Jimmy Brucker, who owned Cars of Stars, for a 71 Volkswagen. All the show cars were a 71 Volkswagen. I, okay. And I think Dad's third non-Mormon wife took off with that car. <laughs> you know? Really? But see, yeah. But after that, Brucker sold them to Bill Hera. And then Bill Hera put the outlaw and the beat McBandit back to the original colors they were. And my dad and brother were working on Knott's Prairie Farm. And so my brother Howard and my dad drove up to Reno every weekend and repainted the outlaw and beat McBandit the way they were originally. Oh, so that's sort of, okay. Right. So then Bill Hera died. And yeah. Tom Monahan, who owns Domino's Pizza and the Detroit Tigers, he bought them. Yeah, all. yeah. yeah so he it. bought them all and had them back there in Ann Arbor. Well, he, Tom went back to work raising money for the nuns that raised him you know as a kid because he was an orphan okay and uh so he sold them to different people and then you know so that's when they went to different people like the the guy from nike owns the road agent now and you know peterson using got the outlaw oh, was, i was saying yeah. outlaws and peterson yeah, yeah. Uh, bill harris kept you know the outlaw so and then you know i guess galvin's trying to you know collect them all because he you know, they found the uh, Mysterion and the Orbitron. And then they just find the, um, um, whatever. Uh, well, yeah, the, the Uncertainty. Uncertainty, yeah. They just found, we're going to see that in uh, Detroit, I think, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I saw. I thought I saw it in Detroit in 2020, but that was a remake some kid made. Oh, is it yeah, really? Because I, I just looked, it was Candy Red, and it was sitting over there by the Beatnik band. Yeah, and yeah, now yeah. I go, well, there's the Uncertainty, but, you know, I didn't read the sign. Yeah, I didn't read the sign. Yeah, sorry. I don't read the sign. <laughs> Even some of the stuff when I was over by Shutton's last, you know, last couple times I was over there, and I'm like, so I said, he's the original ones or he's makes or what, I mean, yeah. what is all stuff? Because so, like the Mysterion, so that was a re, that's a that's a um uh, tribute cut, right? Uh, no, that's the original. I, unless they just found the seat and the body somewhere. Uh, okay, yeah. Because see, when when the Mysterion was done, I went over uh, to it one night, opened the bubble, look at it. I I pull up the upholstery on the seat. See, we made two seats for the Mysterion. Okay. But see, with the bell housings in there, with the two engines, we could yeah. only fit one seat in there. Okay. So the other seat came to our house, and Dad put you know legs on it and stuff. Sixty three. Really? I remember sitting in that all the time. Yeah. So I go, it's really hard to recreate. You know, recreate that stuff. Uh, something like that. Uh, but you know, I'm glad they found it. The real, yeah. the, or they had it. You know, yeah. and, and and redid it. And uh, you know, Shutton is a, a great guy. He does great work on restoring I, stuff. Dude. I think he's amazing. He's probably number one restorer in the world. I, I believe so. I, yeah, I would. As far as restorations go, and what he's doing for what he's paying, I. Don't really know anybody better than Dave Shutton. No, you know, and yeah, that's a good thing that you know both what got him over there at that gas building to oh, you know, man. Do all that stuff because like you even know, Bo are just amazing together. They just clicked yeah, so great. Right? Yeah, it's a it's a good thing. And so like what Dad told me, I told him, look, Dad, you traded all our cars, man, for a a Volkswagen, a Brucker, and he goes, you know what? <laughs> Anyone can own those cars, but they'll always be ours. And you know what? That's Through cool. the years, you that's find cool. out that he's right. And no it, one ever calls that car. Our cars, they go, it's a Roth car. They don't call it a Ford or a Chevy or nothing else. No, it's a Roth car. Yeah, man. that's why we wanted to get rid of that. You know, my mom and dad got rid of the Tweety Pie right away. But that was just to go in the lineup for Ravel. That was just going in the lineup for yeah, Ravel. Yeah, that was so, it. Because that was, it belonged to a dad, my dad's friend by, by the name of Bob Johnston. Okay. And so dad bought it for him. Actually, he, got, bought, he bought Bob Johnston a pool for his house in Anaheim. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because dad was bucks up from, from Ravel then. Okay, so over the years, so was it always the contract was just for Ravel, or was it monogram too? Uh, no, Ravel, because Ravel was separate of monogram. And then yeah. when they made the first Hot Wheel Beatnik Bandit, they yeah. had a license through Ravel. Okay, yeah, because obviously nowadays we have how many how many cars were licensed through Ravel? Uh, can you? I mean, offhand. Oh, uh, ten. Ten. Okay. Yeah. And because we had the uh, monster models in with those too they you, couldn't you know, make monster the, the mo cars fast enough you just couldn't do it we couldn't do it yeah you couldn't make cars fast yeah, it enough. it took dude. us a year to make the body for the road agent dude oh yeah i mean well that's what i'm saying then you're talking in the 60s and early 70s when you guys were making these cars yeah. they don't have any of the technology that we have now i mean these guys are just 3d printing stuff and whatever they're doing now right this was all just paperwork and scratch and, and the it. first cars like uh, the outlaw and beatnik bandit the buck was made out of solid plaster and, you know, it wasn't until around the Orbitron where we started putting the different medias like vermiculite yeah. or foam in there to get it so we could do it with the sure form. So, you know, the first cars were ground to shape. 
That is crazy, man. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that was <laughs> and all the dust and everything that you inhaled as a kid and you're oh. still alive, you're kicking it yeah. People are like, oh, you got a mask on. And you're, and you're eight years old saying it. Hey, fiberglass, you know what, like fiberglass cards after the buck was done, you'd be fiberglass over the outside and then grind it smooth and, you know, do that. They only made one, you know, we didn't make a mold of them, except yeah. for the trikes. You know, after yeah, I was gonna say I was gonna touch base on the trikes because yeah. you made a ton of trikes. Yeah, so that was after like you know the cars were gone. Uh, we started in on the Volkswagen trikes. We first cut up the wishbone. This Volkswagen yeah. car we made, but it had a narrow uh, Volkswagen rear end in it. Okay, but Dad wanted people to be able to buy a Volkswagen kit where they didn't have to have the rear end narrowed. Okay, so we so we can so, take the back end yeah. chassis off of the motor and put it in there. Yeah, so Dad just welded the wishbone back together and sold it to Dirty Doug for a hundred bucks, and we went down and got like a Volkswagen <laughs> across the street <laughs> and uh, started building those trikes. And then, but you Dad knew built a lot of trikes. Yeah, he thought it was going to be like you know even a better deal than it was. I mean, I loved riding them on them and everything, but so we got a patent on them, a United States patent on them. You do have a patent on them. Yeah, for from nineteen seventy to seventy seven, every. Volkswagen trike sold was, what, what you know, but, but my mom and dad didn't oh. want to make like full kit, full cars, because if you put a car, a trike together and then sell it, someone gets hurt, it's screwed. But you had to buy the kit from us. So we sold the bodies and the chassis, and you just got a old. The marketing that you guys had or your father had was yeah. just blows me away. That, I mean, was there, I mean, what was his background before? I mean, was he always just in the cars? I mean, because obviously. I mean, like my dad, I always say it was like, you know, he didn't go to school past yeah. eighth grade because that's yeah. just what happened back right. then. Yeah. But I mean, like, this is unbelievable. Like the market he had, I mean, we're yeah. talking well, about Well, you know, dad, he never missed a day of school when he was going to school. When really? He, from kindergarten to like, you know, when he was a senior in high school, never missed a day. Really? Yeah. Wow. yeah. Perfect attendance at school. That's crazy, so man. He, he just said he just wanted to get out of the house and away from Opa, you know. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. like he joined the Air Force, the you know, minute he got out of high school, just so like he I just, did. So he just, he just booted, because yeah. you did the same thing. We were talking about you. Yeah. Were, so 17, and when you were 17, you got to, sent out to Vietnam War. You were in Germany, right? Yeah. yeah. And then what was your label there? You told me this before. Oh, I was a topographical surveyor. In yeah. 17, you got to school. I mean, yeah. so, so topographical surveyor. Do you even yeah, know, but you, you know, know what? Met? Going into the Army after the first 16 years with Big Daddy was yeah. like a cakewalk, dude. People go, oh, you're going in the Army. You're going to. They're gonna kill you in like uh, basic training. And yeah, all those. So, like I went there and I was like, "What? This is it's like easy, the, right? You yeah. can't even beat on me with a two by four. That you know, that is they didn't do anything, man. Do you, know, do you know how I grew up, brother? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you know, in that way, it was a a lot better deal. But the trikes, uh, you know, it encompassed like the seat. Uh, the driver's seat was lower than both axles, and both seats were in front of the front axle. It has to have yeah. some good for the country and stuff. So what ended up happening? Is right after 1970 when the contract or the the Department of Con yeah. Commerce gave gave the uh, patent on it. Yeah, is that they started building these Mark's big wheels where the seat was lower than okay. both axles, and you really could spin them out for kids and stuff. Come on, really? So you know how there's law lawyers that are always looking like, hey, is someone going to infringe on your rights here or do something here and there? You know, and they go, hey, you know what? This guy's over here is going to build a, a thing called a big wheel and it's infringing on your rights. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. That's you know, the so only killer. money he really made off him was, like, from a toy company. But, you know, it's just like the ones that, like, uh, the one in uh, Elvis's uh, museum over there in Graceland, his yeah. trike. Yeah, his trike. You know, yeah, it was yeah. put together by someone else, but, you know, with all our parts. But it was all your parts. Yeah, you guys, because and you, we you didn't guys sell full, for it, right? Yeah, we didn't sell full bikes because they okay. my mom and dad didn't want no one crash on them and then come back on them so we sold the so there's a liability cost because if you build a full running vehicle that's yeah. totally different now you get like a dealership you know yeah we sold the chassis the body the handlebar everything you needed to make it you know but that, you had to put it together that makes so much sense because what you guys were doing in the 60s and the 70s there were so many kits yeah everybody had i mean you got the bucket kits, the kits yeah, everything you right. know from uh like jc whitney's or sears i mean right. you buy a two bucks from them and but you couldn't they would sell it running but as a kit that you could put together then it was on right. your your hind end yeah if it crashed or fell right. apart going on school. Sure, sure very smart market yeah and that, you know a guy at the that owned the deuce factory back in the day roy fiesta he told me he goes i sell cars but he goes when i sell a car he goes i tell the guy to bring your own wheels and tires i want to keep my wheels and tires so if anything goes on liable like that too he goes wow well like hey i sold you a car but you put your wheels and tires on it before you drove it away 
Oh, really? Well, that and that's takes, just that little that, that, little, that little, little thing takes away the, the, the liability. liability. Yeah, but I didn't know that, you know, back wow. in the day. But, you know. Well, you got to read all the loopholes. It only takes one incident or do whatever, and I get it. Yeah, because I you think know. after, you know, the Rotar blew up at Cobo Hall and hurt some people and the fan, you know, the car that flew. Yeah. And I think my mom and dad were really watching out for that then. Oh, yeah, and for sure, yeah. could happen back. What, what year was that the Rotar blew up? That was early 64. 64. Yeah, yeah. But th- there's a picture of a cop holding up, you know, as part of the fan blades in Cobo Hall. And really? It says, you know, people injured at Cobo Hall and everything. I go, hey, Dad, what were you thinking about, you know, when uh, the cop was holding <laughs> them parts? He goes, well, I, I was hoping they weren't going to look at the engine in, engines in there and see that the numbers were ground off. <laughs> 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 you know, like all those early cars, like the Rotar, you know, uh, Mysterion. Yeah. They had some questionable things as to where you know where, where the parts came from oh Dick, i'm sure Dick sure. cook and you know fritz boyd and tommy yeah. greer from greer black and perdome they'd go out yeah. and get cars at night they go get a car at night so you guys yeah. get build them <laughs> you know like my dad's 55 chevy when you open the hood it said thunderbird on the valve covers really you know oh yeah it had a, thund- it had a 390 in the it. 390 yeah yeah, yeah yeah dude that's so funny man <laughs> and then uh they're just going through tom wolf came out there to write that book you know the uh what is it, the candy colored tangerine flake streamlined baby? And he goes, Yeah, I got in Red Ross race car and we drove over to this other place. And I go, Well, it wasn't really his race car, it was a tow car, but yeah. without a trailer on the back, the thing hauled ass. You know, I had a 390 <laughs> and a C6 in it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a whipping up. But and the 283 out of that 55 Chevy actually went into the Orbitron. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's killer, man. That is really cool. Yeah. Oh man, that is so cool. So 2024 you're still out doing shows you're out doing autographs yeah what what what's what's next for you what are you, what are you doing well now? you know how much dad, guys you got into yeah when dad you know? died i started the metal flake bat uh, yeah you know deal, the whole deal and since then i've got you know out of oh i still have metal flake but i have candy colors base coats clear i got yeah. like a whole gambit of paint now you know automotive finishes so okay that's what i've been running like in these models right now they put my ads for the deal and uh atlantis is calling me and we're doing well, they called me. They want to do those little paints like Dad had, the testers paints for the models. Yeah. So we're going to start doing that with Atlantis. Okay. That is really cool. Because you still sell the, the flake. I mean, I see yeah. you on different shows. I see you on, you know, I mean, obviously you've been on a couple of shows with like uh, Ian's show and stuff oh, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you you guys do a lot of stuff together because yeah. you put your flake on everything, man. Yeah. yeah. And it's so cool. Well, we live out in the desert and the flake shows up good in the sun. You know oh, my God. It shows up great. <laughs> yeah. Because before we made the Volkswagen trikes, we made the Cobra trikes like uh, Dick Allen had. Yeah. And uh, one of the May- uh, Maywood cops' kid got killed on one, and that's when my mom kind of come on, really, yeah. What, what year was that? Uh, sixty-seven. He was racing a sixty-seven or oh, no, a sixty-eight GTX over okay. in Bell, California, on the uh, Captain America uh, V eight trike. Uh, Ernie Captain Flanagan. America, man, holy yeah. cow, man, that yeah. was, was really cool. I hit a dip and like the whole bike just you know destroy itself so my mom was really kind of down on those v8 trikes people got hurt on them man they were well they're kind of uncontrollable i mean a lot of things yeah. were made for look it's kind of like the zingers and all the other yeah. cool stuff you guys made right. but they weren't practical you know right. yeah, yeah. That's, that's dangerous stuff dad drove his around a lot but like we never really raced we used to drive the california cruiser back and forth from maywood to buena park every weekend yeah. you know uh, but you know, dad, dad wasn't really, he was more about looks than, you know, he yeah, goes, your like, dad was a showman, man. Yeah, He goes, once you get on the throttle, dude, then he goes, you're replacing engine parts. Yeah. You know what I mean? Replacing- yeah, it is because it's just like anything. It's just like any kind of racing, yeah. you know? And now you guys were the drag racing circuit. So now was that was more for the show or you guys actually have, you did have a couple of drag cars, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, it was more for that. Uh, 64 dad had a, a, like a Ram charger. He was racing a Hemi. Yep, yep. And then, uh, uh, George, the Bushmaster, had Jim Davis build him a chassis, and uh, but he didn't have the money for the body. Okay. And Dad goes, well, I'll tell you what, we'll make a dragster, and uh, but I'm gonna him and Dad and Steve Swaja designed it and made okay. a, a clay mold of it and took it down to Tom Hanna, and uh, Tom Hanna built that body for the Yellow Fang. And you know, really? like today, no like I think it was in November when I was down at Don Garlitz's. His Don goes, some guy offered him a million point three dollars. For a Come million, on, really? A million three for and the yellow thing. He didn't take it. I go, man, you're crazy, man. And what year is this? Uh, it's 1965. The first year they lifted the nitro band, we had a top fuel dragster called the yellow thing. So in 
that he got offered that kind of money in that year? That year? Oh no, not that year. No, oh, this, this okay. was just in November. Oh, one. yeah, yeah. I was the, say, yeah, the, 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 man, that's crazy. The Yellow money. Fang Dragster is now down at Don Garlis Museum. I was say, Don, yeah, we're actually going to go down in the next month. I think. Yeah. Down, yeah. And then Don was telling me I got offered a man three. Some Arab guys wanted to have that car, and I got, and he goes, he didn't sell it. And I go, wow, you know what? Dad's probably, probably flipping in his grave. Dad's flipping in his yeah. grave. Yeah, you should have sold my car, dude, for a million. I think three. Tom Hanna told me charge Dad twenty five hundred dollars to build that body for it. You oh know. my God! Yeah, I know. <laughs> you what an investment! Like what that. an investment! <laughs> Sixty down to one point three million for a car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, look at the look at the industry now. Though. I mean, yeah. and just the just the, the like I said, just the merch alone. You know, just I mean, obviously I got my own collection of stuff at home, but I went and grabbed a couple of these. You know, the, the repops here. You know, to kind of talk about the models and everything we have going on. And they're literally at every stand over every place. I mean, it's just so epic yeah. to see it everywhere. Yeah, and you know, so well, actually, one of my best T-shirts right now that I'm selling it was done. The artwork was done by Bob. You know, but since he was Bob when he worked for my dad, now he's Robert Williams. You know, uh, yeah. appetite for destruction and everything. Yeah. Doc, documentaries. So the, the whole Robbie Williams thing, right? Uh, uh, well, Robert Williams. Yeah, he Robbie Williams. I think he was a singer from. Yeah. Uh, well, the one that's England. in shut, the one that's in Shutton. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The big Robert Robbie Williams, Williams the yeah. display there. Yeah, okay. Bobby Williams is a singer, but Bob changed his name to Robert R B T W M S. Yeah. Okay. You know, I told him once. I go, Bob. You know how the way I was raised, and he goes, Oh yeah, you were raised just like your dad was. And, you know, like <laughs> German militaristic, German militaristic <laughs> yeah. style. And I go, and I think, I think everything that you guys do and and going through. I mean, how many shows do you still do a year? You think one of these people? Uh, not the same people, but the same shows like, you know, Oakland Roadster Show, Daryl Starbird, you know, forever. You guys have been here remember. since day one, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. My dad and Daryl Starbird were, you know, friends long ago. Like when yeah. dad had the outlaw and Daryl had this predicta. Yeah, they had predicta. Yeah, and then canning shows and then Bob Larravee, you know, World of Wheels that, you know, they, my dad even sold uh, the outlaw and the beatnik bandit to Bob Larravee at one time. Right, and now Pete's running it all. You know, yeah, uh, now Pete now Pete runs the deal. Now Pete runs the deal, but it's just amazing the history that we have going through all, all these cars. And I see this. Uh, I mean, I see they got uh, the Starbird over there signing autographs this weekend, uh, doing stuff with the posters from the Mysterion too. You know. Yeah, dude. You know what? Uh, car shows like I I went to car shows before they were in big arenas like this. I remember going like J C Penney's parking lot in yeah. Huntington Park with the Outlaw, and you know. Uh, on Pacific Avenue there in Huntington Park is where Dirty Doug went over and bought the Hirohata Merc from uh, Hirohata's widow. She lived behind Pep Boys on Pacific. Come on, really? Yeah, dude. So like, the same one that's in Shuttons right now. Yeah, the real Hir Hirohata Merc. The real yeah. Hirohata. Dirty Doug owned that when we were building the, the uh, Beatnik wow. Bandit. And, and that, was, that was still in the 60s too, right? Right, and then the guy goes, oh, I Damn. found the Hirohata Merc on a, a lot in Long Beach. Well, uh, the lot in Long Beach, Dad, in 1959, Dad, Dirty Doug, Larry Watson, George Barris. Uh, God, who was their other? Winfield, probably all the guys. Yeah, well, they all went out and bought brand new 59 Cadillacs. Really? And, and Dirty Doug traded in the Hirohata Merc for a brand new 59 Cadillac. Come on, yeah, really? That, yeah. Yeah, dude, wow. is that a trip? That's a major trip. I, and I it was customized one, and wow, that, is just, that just blows my mind. That's yeah, so crazy. there was a lot of early uh, things going on, you know, at the at the uh, shop, you know, that probably I didn't really know about until I was like, you know, got a little older. And you got a little older. When yeah. I had to work, you know, when I had to start <laughs> working great. 70 yeah. hours a week instead of just yeah. a few. <laughs> when, you're in pre, when you're in 4K, you didn't really, you know, you didn't really know what was going on. But by the time you're second, you're educated and doing the books. Yeah. I know how that life goes. Hey, you yeah. know, uh, when I was a little kid, I thought the Beatnik Bandit was this giant car, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, because I was so little. But like now, it's just you know. the little thing, dude. Yeah, it's dad so could never even fit in himself with the oh, bubble down. No way. I mean, no, yeah. I mean. How, how big was Dad? I mean, it was, it was a uh, one, six, two. Six, three. Six, two, six, three. Yeah. It was six, two, six, three. He was a big dude. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes, you know, he weighed like almost 300 pounds, like on that picture of Dad leaning against the uh, Metro, Nash Metropolitan. Yeah, and yeah. All his Hells Angel gear on. Yeah, it was all Hells Angel gear. Yeah. Did, so did he do when he, <laughs> so like I picked a picture like that with all the Hells Angel. Was that just a spoof to, to get back at people and do his stuff? Uh, no, because like for a while he he was you know hanging out. Uh, there uh, the guy who started the Hell's Angels, his name was Otto Friedley, and uh, he used to hang out with these guys Dougie Poo and Buzzard. And Buzzard is still alive. But I was just gonna say Buzzard's yeah. still alive. Yeah, yeah. He's he. They go by as the early timers now. And I know Ralph White. He won like <laughs> Springfield, Daytona. Yeah, yeah. He won Laconia. And I go out to breakfast with them almost every morning. You know what I mean? In Get out of here, really? Arizona. Yeah, that is so cool. That's a lot. You know, Factory Harley rider from the '60s and one Springfield, Laconia, and Daytona on a really? PSA. Yeah, 
and the original starters and guys from the from the Hell's Angels. And yeah, you, the, really, and the, the guys who started. And you, yeah. and you old dudes are just chilling and having breakfast every morning. Yeah, it's like oh man, you know, like <laughs> and talking about the old days. It's it's kooky, you know, like uh, even uh, you know even today, uh, you know, it's it's hard to believe that the life you lived, you know, like working at Lions every weekend at the drag strip and seeing the evolution yeah. of funny cars, seeing the you know evolution of drag racing you know i guess you know in a, a lot of ways i'm just a lucky guy you got you well. are i mean you're I'm, again we're here i mean we didn't even get to touch base on it because i just love your history too i mean we're here i mean i'm here at this show this year representing evil knievel and over 50 years of excellence and snake river canyon and all that stuff but i mean you yourself are i mean i ever since the friend i met you i was so honored because i mean you're a legend in my mind i mean as a kid growing up with yeah and you know what it wouldn't be there been. if it wasn't you know for all that work and that's one thing i uh, probably learned from my dad the most is just to, like persevere and keep working because uh if you do it on your own you know like whenever i go anywhere and they have me talk about the cars now like the motorcycle yeah. pedia museum yeah. um it's like uh man you can remember so much like you know yeah from each car like oh the problem we had with that and this and that you know but and you can tell stories on every single one of them. I mean, I mean, guys like you, like there's going to be, and you and I are going to talk about it later about some stuff that we got going on there, stuff maybe doing a little history, a little documentary on yeah. your life and your and, and the history of. Uh, well, I, go, I was. I, I want to do it. I think it's. I think it'd be awesome. Yeah. Dude. Like I was telling you, dude. Like when we had Chopper's Magazine, and Dad was interviewing Evil Knievel, and yeah. like I'm uh, 10, 12, 13 years old. Yeah. In the years we had that. And we'd be talking to Evil King Evil out in Los Angeles at the LA Sports Arena. Yeah. And I'd be taking pictures and dad's talking to Evil. And uh then Evil would undo the top of his cane, you know, and take off the top and take a big drink out of his cane. You know, it's like, <laughs> man, you know, I, I never seen that before. I go, Hey dad, you know, what's evil what's evil doing? You know, and he goes, <laughs> What's well, evil got, doing, Dad? Yeah, he's got booze all up in his cane, you know, and I go, Wow, that but you know, he was already limp then. He he was driving Flying the Sportster with the little short wings on it. That was sick. That, no, that was in the parking lot. No, that was but, early 70s then, right? That was. Uh, uh, I think it was. No, it had to have been 67, 68, or 69 because that's when we had Chopper's oh, yeah, Magazine. I mean, you had Chopper's Magazine. Yeah. And I, a lot of people, and again, we didn't even touch it back on that because Chopper's Magazine that people still follow this day. You yeah. guys started Chopper's Magazine. Yeah. Yeah. I worked for I Chopper's mean, Magazine yeah. when I was like a little kid. My, my dad. Epic, bro. Yeah, I mean, like. My was, dad made my older brother quit high school to, to work the dark room. <laughs> <laughs> Howard, yeah, my brother. Ian, Dad, I want to be a doctor. I'll get a dark room. Get a dark room. <laughs> Shut up. I don't care. We we got magazines to print now. Yeah. You know, it's like you guys have, you guys are like leaders in the industry and the icons of what's going on. Everybody's like, everybody sees like, ah, you know, oh, they're, oh, you know, some people I even see that who don't know your history. Yeah. And of course, you know me, I'm a knucklehead. I love all the history right. of everything because we just talk about yeah. any kind of crap. We can, you and I get lost in a corner of two hours yeah. talking about a paint job in a car. Yeah. Um, and I love doing that with you. It's great. But I mean, everybody thinks you're just a cartoonist or something like that. Yeah, like, yeah. And I'm like, no. I'm like, check out, you know, the cars yeah. that you're doing and stuff. And they don't realize the car. I'm like, that's your history. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, that was his dad. I'm like, no, dude, that's him. Yeah. Well, you know yeah, what? Here's the thing awesome. that uh, Big Daddy always told us when we were kids. He goes, that, you know, our job is to sell T-shirts. But he goes, these cars are the signs to bring the people over to the booth for the T-shirts. Yeah. And then we knew that right off the bat. You know, like, even when I was 10 years old, I knew that they were had the road agent or the Orbitron out there, uh, you know, a remote control working them in front of the booth because yeah it was the sign yeah. to bring people over bring to people buy over. a shirt yeah any idea do you think from when dad first started and what the early, the early so what 63 64 when, when do you think he first sold his first t-shirt oh in uh, for sure back in 50s because uh 58 57 58 59 because they were airbrushing shirts um at the car shows to, for how to have something to do, you know, my dad yeah. to stop at JC Penny and get some dollar t-shirts and airbrush a shirt. Well, once he started making characters like rat fink or mother's worry or yeah. like wild child, then it got too much. So that's when we actually started silk screening shirts. So rat, like rat fink. Yeah. So rat, rat fink, rat fink as we have here today. Yeah. And of course, rat fink and Trixie are yeah. here. You know, these two, the most epic, yeah. epic people on, on, right. on the planet here. Yeah. What year did rat fink come out? Uh, well, the first copyright was 63, and then I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, copyrights are forever. And then I think the, the people up in Utah, the Utah Corporation, like, trademarked it in uh, 2001, probably the year Dad died. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So it's okay. a trademark. It's but a trademark. trademark, you got to keep up a copyrights forever. Everything. Oh, my gosh, we know. You know that. What do you think, and if just, just an estimate in your mind or your calculations, how many how many t-shirts do you think you guys have ever sold from day one 
till right now in 2024? You know, I would say with T-shirts and stickers and wrapping keychains, yeah. easily over a million. Oh, like, it's got to be. You know, it's got to be. Easily over a million. It's, oh, it's the wrapping be. keychains, those were actually came out. Some guy made those and put them in gum machines, you know? Yeah. And then dad called them up like in 1962 and said, hey, you know what? I own Rat Fink. And the guy goes, well, I don't know. I have no money. I just made the Rat Fink keychains and put them. In. Then the guy, dad goes, well, give me a million keychains. And the guy did. <laughs> You know, because he was really? from Taiwan or something. Yeah, so we, for a long time, we had key chains we actually threw away when my mom and dad got divorced, bags of them. Because oh, I suppose because dad had so many of them. Yes, yeah. You know, the, I think the best part about all, everything that we touch base on with all you guys from the 50s and 60s, and I mean, that's how I got into it, because yeah. I watched my dad negotiate. It was just epic to me as a kid, right. just going with him and doing whatever. And even what Evil did is promoting and how he did his stuff. It was amazing, because there was no... Like, kids, you know, I mean, I got some young guys working for me. What are you going for? Oh, I'm going for business. I'm going for this sort of business. Like, you guys didn't have that. We grew up on the streets, man. Yeah. And you guys promoted yourself just like that. You make a phone call. It's like, hey, those are my keychains. What do you want to do? Give me a million and we'll call it even. Yeah. You know, but you know, know it was like it, in you know? uh, 1962, Dad took the Beatnik Bandit to the Oakland Roadster show, and it didn't win America's Most Beautiful Roadster. However, that year in 62, at the SEMA show, it won World's Best Engineered Car. And the... So since 1962, Dad told the promoter, I'm not going for no trophies no more. From now on, you pay me. And that set a precedent, too, in the show car world. Because and what year was that? 62. Because 1962, your dad made a precedent to get paid to go to a show. Yes, because the people wanted to see the Beatnik Bandit and the Outlaw and the, and the road course, agent. Because they were all they big model, models. And, you know, we had, like, just garages full of trophies, six foot trophies from Mickey Thompson's and Pomona, all this, that. that and dad so goes, you cool, know what? Man. Now I want a free booth. I want to be paid to come because the guys didn't pick the beat McBanda for the world's most beautiful ward war roadster. Cause dad and, uh, Frank Petragon were using nylock nuts then. Okay. And you, at the end of your tie rod, you're supposed to have them drilled and pinned. Yeah. Drilled and pinned. Yeah. 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 So, but the, the judges had never seen nylocks in just 62. And so when they saw the nylocks on, they go, oh, points off the Beatnik Bandit for not having, you know, drilled and pinned. Really? And that goes, that's it. That's Did, it. So, so that's something it. like that. Yeah. Really? I'm, yeah, I'm done with it. And then he would use that as a uh, promotion, too. Like if people were there and trying to sell German helmets like we were. or Yeah. Uh, he would tell them, the promoter, Blackie or Baggy, yeah. uh, whoever it was, he'd tell them, get that guy out of here or I won't bring the road agent next year. And guess what? That guy it, was out. That guy was out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, so, so Big Daddy had a little bit of power once, you know, with the toy company. With the know. toys company. Also. Yeah, with the yeah. models and stuff. So, and that's when he started just saying, like, I, I ain't coming, dude, for a trophy no more. You guys that don't even know what a, a and, lock is. Because <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even know what it was. <laughs> yeah. And even now with the model kits, the model kits are still being reproduced today in 2024. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I'm getting together with Atlantis. They called me. They want to make uh, a new, like, line of testers paint the Ed big daddy rock yeah. colors yeah I was gonna say, we're gonna make the little daddy car colors now making little daddy car colors yeah. yeah it is so amazing to me that you are still out here promoting and 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 networking and everything that you do all the time it never stops and i don't think a lot of people realize that what it is it's 24 7 job i mean you started this you could have just hung this up and said i'll just do whatever noise stuff yeah not only are you here you could have you could have had a couple yeah. hotties down in the booth down there and you could be sipping and you know whatever you want to go yeah. You love this, man. Look at your face, yeah, man. Yeah, you I know mean, what? You know you what? It is, awesome. It's not like just a hobby. A lot of people like uh, say it's a hobby. For, for me, it is my life. You know, Dude, what I mean? you live it. That's yeah, exactly. exactly. We do. We live this stuff. <laughs> right. it's, it's a lifestyle you know, and not like something. Oh, my like God. I life. love it. Yeah. Well, that's what we did when I started the Motor Mania brand. We're like, it's not just a brand. It's a lifestyle, man. That's and right. It, and, it, and it is. And it's it's a lifestyle. It's all we know. It's all. It's still all I know is growing up. Yeah. Everybody's like, what did you do last night? Like, I don't know. I, said, I was talking to big da a little daddy for a while and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, Saw Scratch and Murph and all those guys yeah. are chopping top down there. And it was like, oh, my God, it's so epic. And I'm like, we'll just come and hang out. They're all normal dudes, man. Yeah, right. Even Rawlings, I mean, we're hanging out, and some guy made a comment on some social, and he's like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he's such a jerk. I'm like, dude, he's a cool guy. He's a promoter. Yeah. yeah. How can you get mad at somebody that's there? It goes back to the famous saying, don't yeah. get mad at what you don't have yeah. for the work you didn't put in. Right. You and, know, I mean, come and, on. and that came back to me because, like, when I was 20 years old, that's when I first met Jeff Beck, you know, and I, I was thinking, man, you know, he's a big time hitter, guitar player and shit. And then, yeah. you know, after you go to his house a couple of times and you see all this hot rods and you go, man, you know what? This guy is just another hot rodder. Yes. And, and, and I, and, you know, cause I asked him when I was, you know, like back in, when I was 20, 49 years ago, I asked him, Hey Jeff, you know, uh, 
what about this guy, you know, whoever it was, Ingway Malmstein? He goes, you know what, Dennis? He goes, I was lucky. When I was a kid, the Yardbirds hired me. Yeah. You know, yeah. and he goes, I, but, and then my other. Jeff Beckman. Yeah, and then my other friend who who is has a band called uh, Sublime, Bud from Long Beach, he goes, yeah. dude, you know, he goes, it is luck. But he goes, you make your luck as well. Yeah. So, you know, two of these big guys that, you know, Lynn, they're all car guys. Like Jimmy, uh, like, uh, no, uh, uh, ZZ Top. Oh, yeah, yeah, Billy Gibbons. Billy. Man, a big car guy. You know, you wouldn't even know. Billy you is, see him all the car shows. You see him everywhere. You know, Billy, Billy is salt to the earth, just like you guys are. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, like, any guy, it doesn't. So, like, even if you if you have some money when you get a little older, you're a rock star or whoever, you, you're you going to spend your money on cars. Well, anyway, it, it just shows to Goya that, you know, many guys, a lot of people are into the different hot rod genres and you know, the more money you got, the more cars you got, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, you know, as far as you're doing stuff and, and as far as it goes, it's like, um, you know, as far as everything everything I got going on, I think it's 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 unbelievable. I mean, even the crowds here today, the people are going on all the genres and, and doing stuff, I think it's great. You know, I think yeah. uh and people know your name no matter where you go and, and it's just I think it's great. I think it's epic yeah. what you do, man. And exactly. I and I, I love I love what you're doing and you know, I'm gonna have you sign a couple of things and maybe autograph the new uh, cool trailer that we're doing. Mr. Gasser, uh, Mr. Mr. Gasser, and what's your favorite one? You gotta have a favorite, right? Before we head out, uh, I think my favorite car of all was the Druid Princess, because really? you know, we could really? drive it a lot around. And you know yeah. what? Dodge actually gave us that engine. That engine in that car still to this day probably has less than a thousand miles on it. Are you serious? Yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> oh my god, the uh, oh my god. Thank you, Chrysler, for that engine. That is so epic. That is so epic. So. Over the years, obviously, I'm sitting here at Starbirds, and we got a couple things we've been doing here. We're bringing Evil back for a 50 year reunion of all this other sort of stuff. Right. What, what, what best memory do you got of Evil, and what, what, what over the years of doing stuff? Because you had to see well, him many times over here. My you know? uncle Bob taking, you know, his uh, he had a Volkswagen trike, you know, that uh, we made back in the day, and he went up to watch Evil jump the canyon up there. Yeah, and he was up there on his trike then, so there was a Roth trike represented at the Evil jump. And I remember all that leading up to it. And I, yeah. you know, I remember being in Vegas. I wasn't there when he jumped the deals, but I remember being there at, in that era, you know, 63 yeah. or whenever it was, 64. Yeah. Yeah, Evil, Evil Knievel was a big hitter. And then, like I said, when he came to the uh, canning show in L.A. at the sports arena, you know, I was just in awe of him. And, yeah. You know, even after I did see him taking drinks out of his cane, I, you know, well, I, mean, I mean, I think that's the best part of the whole story. Yeah. I think that's the best part of the whole story. It's wild. It's wild. Well, man, well, it looks like the crowds are getting going here, man. It's almost noon already here. And then, uh, is it? Wow. Yeah, I suppose we better get on your booth. You've been hanging out with me for like an hour and a half, I think. You know? Oh, I have. Oh, I, I better get out of here. You better get out of here. My so. mind's going to be shot. By the yeah, you're going to be like, I, I got nothing to tell you today because I, I gave it all the bag <laughs> upstairs, man. So, all right, everybody. Well, let's walk. Uh, uh, thanks for having uh, little daddy on the door today. And uh, we're going to sign some stuff. New to every brother. All right, bro. All Talk right. Talk to you guys later. All right. Later, brother. Thanks for being on the show. Ah. Uh... <laughs>